This is the newsroom for today, Tuesday, March 16, 2021. We are broadcasting to you on E1, SCAR TV, NTN and Tarzi TV in Barteca. In the headlines, the Housing Ministry distributes record-breaking $13.9 billion in contracts. Housing has always been a priority of this PVPC government. Lusignan prisoner escaped nabbed, stealing from Ruby Chicken Farm. Traffic runs get training to identify persons being trafficked and in sport, Foster concerned with process at GCB elections rather than winner and youth basketball Guyana receives massive financial support. With the news, I'm Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for joining us. We start off by telling you that over 50 contractors, 26 of whom are new, received contracts totaling $13.9 billion from the Ministry of Housing and Water to commence a series of infrastructural projects and the construction of some 290 homes in the first quarter of 2021. More in this report. The 199 contracts, which are record-breaking for the ministry, were distributed at the simple ceremony held at the Arthur Chang Conference Center on Tuesday. Some 190 elevated two-bedroom homes are to be built at Cummings Lodge East Coast Demerara, while another 100 flat two-bedroom homes will be constructed at Prospect along the east bank of Demerara. More importantly, 80% of the $13.9 billion will be spent on infrastructure works in several regions across 21 communities. Chief Executive Officer of the Central Housing and Planning Authority assured that all the projects followed the standard tendering process and were void of sole sourcing. We are also proud to state that all the contracts being signed here today went through a bidding process and were awarded by the Board of Central Housing and Planning or the National Tender Board. All contracts received the requisite approval from Cabinet. There were no sole sourcing. Also addressing the gathering was the minister within the ministry, Susan Rodriguez. She was the first to put contractors on notice that the contracts must be completed in a timely manner to high standards of quality and with value for money to the taxpayers. Underscoring the historic nature of Tuesday's awards, Rodriguez said the PPPC government has now budgeted monies in excess of what was budgeted for the housing sector over the last five years. It is... Simply put, a demonstration that where there is a will, there is a way. And we at the Ministry of Housing and Water and at the level of the government, from the time we took office on August 2nd of 2020, have hit the ground running and have not let up since that time. Rodriguez was backed up by Senior Housing and Water Minister Colin Kroll, who said that well over 8,000 allottees stand to benefit from these contracts upon completion. He too expressed his expectation of efficiency and maximum quality. Housing has always been a priority of this PVPC government. In fact, you don't have to look far back. Just look at the last PVPC government. No coincidence for which the Housing Ministry was then led by our current president, Dr. Irfan Ali, who spearheaded that ministry and for which, and for which in the last five years, today's investment represents more than even what they did in the last five years for that sector. Kroll also announced that the ministry was working with the Guyana Water Incorporated to improve the access and quality of water in several villages and communities across the country. Also present at the ceremony and delivering a charge to the contractors was Senior Minister with Responsibility for Finance, Dr. Ashley Singh. You have an important responsibility to ensure that these contracts are executed on time and in line with specification. Yes, you have an important role to play in that regard. Yes, and CEO, you have an extremely important role to play in this regard. And so I don't want us only to do this nice ceremony and sign and feel that we have achieved something big when we pay the mobilization advance. Because I can tell you it is my intention to visit some of these communities. He recalled the PPPC's massive housing drive and the attention placed on housing prior to 2015. Dr. Singh credits the success of several new communities today to the hard work of then Minister of Housing and Water and now President of Ghana, Dr. Irfan Ali. 
We tell you now that 48-year-old Philip Jangru, who escaped from Luziknan prison in November last year, was on Tuesday morning nabbed by residents of Ruby, who caught him stealing from a chicken farm in the area. A resident told the newsroom that Jangru stole a generator and two water pumps from the chicken farm and hid it under a jamun tree. When he was confronted over the theft, Jangru ran away and eventually jumped into the Atlantic Ocean and tried to swim away. However, residents followed him in a boat and brought him to shore. The police then took him into custody. Jangru, along with Mark Emmanuel, 18, and Donald Beard, 40, escaped from Luziknan prison on November 21, 2020, by using a bed sheet as a rope. Jangru, known as Tanki, was charged with the murder of Mark Narain, known as Marco, between March 13, 31, 2019, at School Dam, Richmond Hill, Leg 1. According to reports, Narain and Jangru were friends and were drinking together when an argument erupted. Subsequently, Narain was riding his motorcycle along School Dam when he was lashed off the motorcycle by Jangru. The Narain was allegedly thrown overboard and into a nearby trench by Jangru. The next day, Narain's lifeless body was discovered in the trench. An autopsy confirmed that Narain died from drowning, but he had wounds to his head consistent with being hit with an object. Guyana has been battling the COVID-19 pandemic since March 2020. Now with at least seven different vaccines across three platforms rolled out globally, the Ministry of Health continues to innovate to ensure the fulfillment of the government's intention of vaccinating all Guyanese by the end of 2021. Daniel Swain reports. In a bid to get Guyana closer to herd immunity, the Ministry of Health is partnering with several faith-based organizations, NDCs and other clubs to get the vaccine out to persons who need it the most. Today we're covering one such initiative at the Burns Memorial Presbyterian Church on Vicentian Road. We have presently more than 30 fixed sites in the country. The Ministry of Health is one, Diamond is another, Enmore is another, uh, Georgetown Hospital is another. But in addition to these fixed sites, we have roving teams. So I am happy to say that we have teams in each region going to people's home, people who are not ambulatory. Um, so we don't want people to endure the pain of fetching their loved ones to come and get their vaccine. So if they are home, bound that we we come to you and so for people who call us and explain their situation we send the team to their home because this group that we are focusing on right now are the elderly 60 and older we have decided that in addition to people who chose to come to us at our fixed sites that we will go to them. What you are seeing today at the Burns Memorial Presbyterian Church is an example of us coming to the people. The Burns Memorial Presbyterian Vaccination Initiative was organized by Minister of Education Priya Manik Chan, who shared her thought process and motivation behind Tuesday's job mobilization. This is the Barnes Memorial Presbyterian Church where we're physically based, but this is the over 60 population of the East Demerara Parish of the Presbyterian Church. So what we did was amongst the churches, Burns here in Georgetown, Ogle, Triumph and Better Hope, organized to get our over 60 population to one location so that it would make sense for the Ministry of Health to come to the location and administer the vaccines. We spoke to some of the persons who came out to fortify their immune system against the COVID-19 virus that has already claimed, up to press time, 209 Guyanese lives. They shared their reasons for opting to take the vaccine and their experience at the Burns Memorial mobile vaccination site. I came forward in, in order to protect myself, protect my family, protect my community, and I want to invite you to do the same. No, I'm not scared. The idea is a lot of people are taking it. Bigger than me take it. Older than me taking it. So I have no problem. Actual vaccine is quite okay. You're not feeling anything. And they said you might have some fever or whatever. And so far, thank God, nothing. I don't know. 
am most grateful to take this vaccine, which I know is real, real, real benefit. Especially these ageable people like me, with sickness, I mean, thing that sugar pressure or anything, and I, I, I can advise you all, anyone who doesn't take it yet, please, it's for your own health, and it's just a minute, and I took it and I'm okay. So I encourage you all, please take it. Dr. Ramsamy said the Burns Memorial Presbyterian Vaccination Initiative is just one of many future partnerships. And this is a model that we are now trying to roll out. So we have asked the pastors, we have asked the pandits, we have asked the, the, the Muslim community to use their mobilization power to bring people together. We are also working with NDCs. So the NDCs, they know their catchment area. They know the persons who are 60 and older. We are asking them to mobilize. So on Thursday, we are going to experience an NDC style mobilization in Canal Polder number two. Canal Polder number two has mobilized more than 300 senior citizens and we are going to um, learn from this experience so it runs smoother on Thursday. On Saturday, Minister Vindi Passan, through her ministry, they are doing an outreach in Tushan. So we expect to 300 people, elderly people at that outreach and we will have our vaccination teams. We are urging all the NDCs to do the same, mobilize their people. We will come to the people. Guyana is currently administering the Oxford, AstraZeneca and Sinopharm vaccines and is expected to receive Russia's Sputnik V COVID-19 vaccine this Thursday, March 18, 2021. If you or anyone in your community would like to partner with the Ministry of Health to roll out vaccines in your area, you can call 226-1560. This is Daniel Swain reporting for the newsroom. When the newsroom returns, the Ministry of Health is designing a program to prioritize the handling of end-stage kidney disease and diabetes. Welcome back. This is the newsroom. The Minister of Health, Dr. Frank Anthony, on Tuesday said the Ministry of Health under the Chronic Disease Department has been working on putting together a program catering for almost all of the chronic diseases, but especially end-stage kidney disease and diabetes. The minister anticipated that in putting together the program, it will change the landscape of what is happening with chronic diseases in Guyana. Also, he hopes in the next five years, there is a more strategic plan for every chronic disease that affects Guyana. Minister Anthony said that there are specific chronic diseases that his ministry will be zooming in on, specifically diabetes, since this chronic disease is more prevalent in Guyana. One of our priority would be to look at uh, diabetes, for example. Um, and we have a number of special programs that we are developing. One such special program that we'll be developing for diabetes would include piloting a one-stop shop, so to speak. Um, in this year's budget, we have allocated $35 million to build a facility that would be housing a couple of things. One, doctor's offices, uh, a person who can provide nutritional advice to patients, um, the persons who would be able to uh, screen uh, your eyes, uh, because um, that is also important if someone is diabetic. Persons who would be able to do um, uh, check your feet to ensure that you, your feet is okay uh, because you know diabetics can have these challenges with their feet and of course uh, to have good labs available. So when you come to this center so to speak all these services would be available to you and uh, we think by doing that we'll prevent the kind of fragmented care that sometimes uh, obtain. 
and, and we probably would be able to manage our diabetic patients much better. 2020 ended with a total of 225 persons being rescued and prevented from being trafficked by the Counter Trafficking in Persons Unit. This was revealed at a one-day workshop held by the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security on Tuesday. Sheena Henry tells us more. With over 200 persons, including women and children, now safe from the threats of human trafficking, Guyanese authorities are looking to ramp up training for traffic ranks of the Guyana Police Force. Co Coordinator of the Counter Trafficking in Persons Unit, Tanisha Williams Corbin, explained that the Ministry of Human Services and Social Security and the Ministerial Task Force have over the years developed and implemented various initiatives to respond to the issue. So this training is designed to equip the frontline officials, the tra our traffic ranks, with the necessary tools to be able to identify assist and refer victims of human trafficking that they may come into contact with while doing their, their work on the roadways. So they'll be taught what are the indicators to look for. Those indicators were specifically designed to target and inform them. For example, is this a group of children who are traveling without parents? Is this a group of children who are traveling alone? So those are some of the indicators that they are going to be taught what to look for. And it is expected that we'll be able to get through this training pretty well because we have done quite a number of them between 2019 to the present and we have seen our results. We have seen traffic ranks calling in to give reports of suspected cases and so. So we do believe that they're going to fare really well and we are looking forward to continuing this training throughout the length and breadth of Guyana. Meanwhile, Force Training Officer Superintendent Shif Prasad Bacchus explained the program will be continuous as members of the police force are considered frontline workers and first responders. Senior Probation and Social Services Officer Denise Ralph encouraged the officers to be open to participation, reminding that they are there to gain the necessary knowledge on the issue at hand. You here at this program, you not only here just to sit, but you need to participate and you need to ask questions, see clarity. If you don't understand something from your, parties, from your facilitators, you ask questions so you'll be clear on what traffic and importance is. The workshop will include presentations from various officials and representatives from the Guyana Police Forces TIP Unit, the Chambers of the Director of Public Prosecution, the Ministerial Task Force, and the Guyana Geology and Mines Commission. Reporting for the newsroom, I am Sheena Henry. Development works at the Indian Arrival Monument at Palmyra East Barbese received a timely boost on Tuesday, with Terminal Paints Inc. making a significant financial contribution to help with efforts to convert the facility to a modern public park. More in this report. Minister of Culture, Youth and Sport Charles Ramson Jr. was in hand at Continental Group of Companies, the home of Terminal Paints, to receive the company's generous donation from Chief Operating Officer Fenton Prasad. Prasad in brief remarks applauded the ministry on its initiative to develop the facility, noting that it will enhance the spirit of the community and provide a much needed recreational center for leisure and relaxation. Turgino has been in Burbies for since the inception, you know, and we are known throughout the, the county. We hope that this contribution will be able to complete successfully this project and hope that in the future we will be able to see the community enjoying the much needed leisure and relaxation in the center. Targonal Paints Inc. has enjoyed decades of close relations with provisions with many of its dealers and customers located across the region. Minister Ramson Jr. expressed gratitude to the company for fulfilling its promise to support the modernization of the Palmyra Monument. The intention, as we had said a number of months ago, was to turn this, this monument space into a public park and a cultural center as well, so that the people of Barbies can have a space for them to be able to go and it's safe and for them to be able to practice their cultural activities as well. Um, Continental Group of com Companies had indicated their willingness to support when I made that announcement. Uh, today is the day of the realization of, of that commitment. The minister added that government is moving in the direction of making public spaces a lot friendlier for leisure, cultural, sport and community-based activities. Uh, so you'll see a lot of this happening throughout the country and this is a, one of the steps that we can do so where government and private uh, companies uh, can partner together so that we can create a lot of benefits for people at all across the country. At an outreach in Burbies last December, 
Ramson Jr. told the media that the enhancement plans will see playground equipment and Wi-Fi infrastructure installed to provide free internet access to the public. More seating areas will also be provided and the visitors' gallery will also be used for cultural activities. Commissioned in 2019, the 160 million Guyana dollars monument features six bronze statues donated by the government of India to Guyana in 2017. This is the newsroom. The issue of patient abandonment at the Georgetown Public Hospital is putting a strain on the public institution. Coordinator acting of the Social Work Department, Clayton Newman, told the newsroom that approximately 10 patients have been left at the institution by relatives who refuse to care for them. As Guyana joins with the world in celebrating World Social Work Day on Tuesday, Newman and social worker Marissa Wilkie sat down with the newsroom to explain the notable work they are doing and other challenges they face. The social work department consists of many little units. You have um, social workers in the psychiatric unit. You have social workers that work in the clinical area. You have social workers that work on the medical area, right? Presently, there's a social worker at oncology. There's a social worker at nephrology. There is two social workers at the psychiatric clinic. You have three social workers at the medical block and they cover the entire hospital. If you understand the, the healing process, medication work for, to a point. Um, the biopsychosocial component of the patient helps them to relax. Um, you counsel them, you work with the families against all odds, and you make sure that all is well for them. Good. So how the process work at Georgia Hospital and the clinics? The patient comes to see the doctor. Um, if the doctor realizes that the patient has a social need or he is disturbed in any way, they would refer that patient. Or they would ask the social worker to see that patient. Outside of that, the social workers run the block or the wards on a daily basis or almost every day, but it's a daily should be a daily basis and you observe patients that need help. Well, there's a major challenge, especially at Joshua Hospital. Um, for some reason or the other, persons out there are now finding it the ideal thing to abandon the patients. Those seniors, um, there's a talk somewhere out there that the best place to leave your patient is at Joshua Hospital where you can't take care of them anymore. But we ask the persons, this is from that. You can contact the PAMs, you can contact any elderly home because in so doing, you actually leave a burden and a strain on the Georgian Public Hospital. And we have patients for more than six months, three months, and, and, and that kind of stuff. It's ridiculous to hear your family tell you, look, I, I am not taking them back. Don't bring them here. And you know, who's to take care of them? And because of that, you know, they just stay stuck with us and on a sad note, some of them go home from right here and they die in despair. We also ask the general public to cooperate with us so that when they meet e emergency, they give the right information that is needed and specific to the patient. My role here as a social worker is basically to bridge the gap between medical or persons with medical issues or terminal illness and a way of aiding them to get the resources or ad advocate for them to get the resources that they need for recovery. I also help to link persons with various or network with various institutions or organizations in order for them to get the required help that is needed at that time. Yes, we do have many challenges and most of it stems from not having sufficient resources, not only for ourselves, but those for the persons who are in need. Happy social work dear to all the social workers in Georgian Public Hospital, those working so hard at the clinical area, at the health centers, and spread abroad. Those that are in the social work profession, the social workers at Georgian Hospital say to you, happy social work.
The Minister of Human Services and Social Security, Dr. Vindya Prasad, will join a number of high-profile speakers on March 16 at a 65th session of the Commission on the Status of Women, the United Nations' largest gathering on gender equality and women's rights in New York, USA. The virtual two-week gathering for UN member states, civil society organizations, gender experts and other international actors aims to build consensus and agree on a roadmap to advance gender equality. We are now in the decade of action to deliver the Sustainable Development Goals and it is imperative that introspection is followed by action. It is a travesty that 25 years after Beijing, no country has achieved gender parity. This year's theme of women's full and effective participation and decision making in public life as well as the elimination of violence is timely. Both elements are critical to achieving gender equality and the Sustainable Development Goals. Women are playing an essential role in the socio-economic and political development of the CARICOM region and can be found in leadership positions in every sphere of influence, including politics, public services, business and in civil society. There is, however, still much work to be done. The UN Secretary General's report, released in 2020, highlights that worldwide women are still underrepresented in public life and decision making. Less than 7% of the heads of state are women, and while the proportion of women in parliament has doubled globally since 1995, men still hold 75% of seats. While not present in large numbers, historically, women in the Caribbean community have been actively involved in politics and have made important contributions to the legislative agendas in their respective countries. They have established themselves as dependable partners in the development process and play a crucial role in promoting sustained and inclusive economic growth and in poverty eradication. They also continue to be influential through their involvement in civil society, women's organizations, as well in other civic engagement, including academia. On behalf of Guyana, I emphasize Guyana's commitment and comprehensive drive to eliminate the dark veil of violence which engulfs too many women and girls. Our cohesive multi-sectoral approach includes prevention and intervention strategies including data collection and analysis to allow for evidence-based policy decisions. An aggressive reporting campaign is engendered by our toll-free 24-hour hotline, which enables victims of violence, abuse and trafficking to access immediate help and support services. This is complemented by an app which links victims of violence to help services, vocational training opportunities, and resources to move them from dependence to independence. Mr. Chairman, deep psychological scars of violence haunt survivors. The government of Guyana provides consistent psychosocial support through our Survivors Advocates program, countrywide one-stop advocacy centers for children and soon adult survivors consolidate all necessary services under one roof, including reporting and a forensic interview where children tell their story once to all reporting agencies in a protected environment. Three sexual offenses courts and the planned expansion of legal aid services support access to justice for victims of violence from our hinterland to the coastland. Now, President Irfan Ali has announced that government will soon launch an aquaculture master plan that will see the sector take off. The president said the government uh, was encouraged to think unconventionally and move the change to an aquaculture-based maneuver as a result of climate change and the changing landscape of the fisheries industry. Sheena Henry reports. The Ministry of Agriculture through the Fisheries Department has since commenced sensitization and consultation exercises with the fisher folk community to organize and ensure the sector is developed in a sustainable manner. On Saturday last, Agriculture Minister Zulfikar Mustafa met several fishermen from Region 6, the largest shrimp producing region, to inform them of government's plans for the sector and to get their input on what government can do to assist them. Because what we have done over time, we have ensured that we develop the traditional sector in the agriculture sector and other sectors, right, to ensure that we create wealth and we create jobs. You know, for a fact, many Guyanese would have lost their jobs, uh, jobs also during the last five years, especially areas like these, sugar, the sugar industry, 
the private sector would have people would have lost job the construction sector and things like that the minister explained that within a matter of months three technical officers from india will be coming to develop the ministry's plans for the sector so whilst we are making doing the preparatory work to launch the aquaculture plan and the aquaculture program by his excellency we are preparing the groundwork and we are looking at large acreage of land because the Guyana, the Guyana Lands and Survey Commission will be part of this committee and also the MMA, the Mahaika Maikonia Bari Development Scheme, they will be part of this committee too because when you look at West Coast Barbies in Region 5, there are a lot of lands on the north and over of the public road where we can develop the aquaculture industry there with different species. He added that while the government intends to improve agriculture generally, the aquaculture sector is being targeted for massive development in both the long term and short term, with government aiming to increase annual shrimp production from 150,000 kg and 200,000 kg to 500,000 kg. He further stated that government will be assisting farmers with feed, fingerlings and other materials to help their production. For the newsroom, I am Sheena Henry. Residents of Region 10 have committed their support to the government as it continues its progressive work across the country. The commitment was made to the Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Hugh Todd, during this visit to the Upper Demerara Burbis region on Friday. Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Hugh Todd, met residents of Batuba, Demerara River, and Christianberg Linden where we distributed food hampers to those most affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. While expressing gratitude for the assistance, residents highlighted the wide range of work the government has been executing across the country over the last few months. We are very happy for the visit and we hope the visit continue. I don't know how much more to thank you. Very much happy. I love this party, man. And I feel glad to see y'all and I hope you continue to give us more visit because I'm fighting for more votes for y'all in Linden and Christian. Well, thank you very much and continue. Over in Batuba, Andy Fleming said, life there was about to return to the glorious days because of the government's interest in their people. Most of us have lived through the previous administration and we know that the times they passed through. And we have had a taste of what the... the, the, the the PPP were before that, before that administration. And um, I think we, they, by God's grace, they try to live up to the word. And so we are going to do our best um, to make sure that, that their expectations for us, you know, will take place. Also expressing her sincerest gratitude was Margaret Jeffrey, an 89-year-old who has been farming all her life. Thank you to this government for... All the little support, we had a little money and we were very thankful to the government for it and we are saying thanks today and God bless the government with new visions day by day and we are so happy. Thank you. Meanwhile, Minister Todd said the work being carried out by the government is nothing strange since they were elected to serve. This is what the party is about. It's a party that respects each and every Guyanese citizen. It's a pro-poor party. It's a working class party. And we believe and we stand by that, that code. We are very happy with the outreaches that we've done so far. And this is bringing government to the people. Most of you are not able to leave your busy schedule to come to Georgetown to meet with ministers. And we know that because you have to carry on with your lives. We're the ones who have to leave our offices and come to you. And this is how it's supposed to be. So what we're doing is not anything to praise us for. This is what we should be doing. Reporting for the Newsroom, I am Danica Paul. When well, the Newsroom returns, the financial weather and bridge reports along with sport.
Welcome back to Newsroom. Now for a look at what's happening in sport. We're starting off with some cricket news. President of the Burbies Cricket Board, Hilbert Foster, said his concern over the long-awaited Guyana Cricket Board elections lies not with who wins, but rather ensuring the board returns to a legal status. More from Akim Green. Foster, who was speaking on the sidelines on Sunday after the conclusion of BCB's second division 100 ball tournament, was responding to questions from the media on the delay of the GCB elections. The elections were slated to be held on February 26, were postponed after Escobar Cricket Board, who did not submit the mandated list of delegates to their attorney, raised some complaints with regards to the verification of clubs in an email to Cricket Ombudsman Kamal Ramkaran on Friday 25th. The Mara Cricket Board and Burbis Cricket Board had submitted their delegates and were present for the intended election. Someone told me the hardest part of 100 meters is the last 10, 10 meters, so it's, it's going to come. And um, I don't, I'm not concerned about who wins the election. What I'm concerned is that finally the Guyana Cricket Board could be considered legal. You could approach sponsorship. Ramkaran had pointed out that the issue outlined in the mail open quote, was not about putting forward delegates, but rather my function of verifying registers, end quote. The cricket ombudsman, having been appointed by the sport minister of the consultation on cricket West Indies, has two functions, to verify the register of clubs and perform the functions of the returning officer for the first election of the membership of the Ghana Cricket Board. GCB Secretary Anand Sinasi had said at a press conference that he felt the Obelsman did what he thought was correct. I would say that the Obelsman did what he thought was right. Um, he hasn't been in the job for a very long time. In, in fact, in a matter of days, he was thrown in there to make some decisions. I think what led to that meeting, the whole issue before Demerara Board, the meeting with purported meeting with Cricket West Indies and whoever and so on. Um, all, all of those compounded to what resulted there. I, um, I'm not surprised that it happened, but I would prefer not, because of um, these matters being in the domain of the court still, and I really don't know uh, what eventually is going to happen there, but I think um, there's some sort of um, effort to resolve the issues. Meanwhile, should forces sit on a new GCB executive, he hopes to bring his marketing skills to help the GCB attract more major sponsors. Just like how Barbie's Cricket Board is getting sponsorship, I'm confident that um, the guy in the Cricket Board could be able to do the same. And if I'm part of the executive, I'm excited to, to share with my fellow executives them the um, there are many ideas that I have in my brain, my brain that um, that I could share with them, and we could get Guyana cricket just like Barbies cricket. No new date has been confirmed as yet for the GCB elections. For the newsroom, Akim Green. Batsman Darren Bravo said he's eagerly looking forward to the Test matches against Sri Lanka after ending the ODI leg of the series on a high. The left-hander stroked his fourth ODI 100 to lead a successful West Indies run chase to close out this three-match series 3-0. Speaking ahead of the two test matches, Bravo touched on his form and the criticism he has received since his return to international cricket. Um, obviously, it's always good to, to get runs under your belt. Um, it's always good to spend time out in the middle, um, also just before the start of a test series and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, it's a totally different format. So... Yes, we have a couple of days before the start of the test series, so it's important that you know you utilize those, utilize those days in the most, um, in the best way possible before the test test match starts. Criticism, <laughs> I think it's part and parcel of the game, but um, for me, it's a situation where I don't really listen to the critics that much. Uh, more so, I only listen to the people that definitely care about me and stuff like that. Um, you know, sometimes when you're not doing well. You don't hear from a lot of people, and when you happen to have a good day out in the out in the middle, you know your phone is filled with messages and all the, the best wishes and stuff like that. So for me, to be honest, it's just a matter of listening to the people who've been there for me, you know, through the good and bad, more so than people who just feel to say something because they have a mouth. So for me, just trying to stay positive as much as possible, trying to learn as much as possible, and just trying to do the best for us in this career. We tell you now that Michael Holding has won the Sports Journalist Award, that's the SJA Award for Best Pundit in 2020. 
The Sports Pundit Award, which is decided by an SJA members vote, was given to the former West Indian Pace Bowler Holding for his powerful testimony about racial injustice in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd on Sky Cricket's coverage of England against West Indies in July 2020. Alongside Ebony Rainford Brent, a nominee in the same category, Holden delivered an emotional and impassionate plea for an end to institutionalized racism through meaningful change in society as the pair reached, uh, reacted to the death of Floyd in police custody in Minnesota. In his acceptance speech delivered via video at the awards ceremony hosted online due to COVID-19, Holden said, and I quote, It is something that has been in me and in my head for many, many years. People don't understand what it is like to go through life and always thinking that people think less of you than what you think of yourself. It can be a little bit tiring, and when I got that opportunity, it just came spilling out." End quote. Now, Youth Basketball Guyana has struck a significant partnership with the American company Edison Chuhest Offshore and its local subsidiary, G Boats Guyana, giving the local group a hefty figure in sponsorship. Akim Green reports. YBG has found major partners as they work their way to hopefully restart a national school basketball festival, which has not been played since July 2018, mainly due to the pandemic affecting the restart of the 2020 season. The festival exposes talents who might have been otherwise overlooked since the festival looks to tackle grassroots basketball at the multiple schools throughout the country. Co-director at YBG, Chris Bauman, said they are toying with the idea of a possible restart in late July, early August. However, in any notion of such, is it dependent on the prevailing COVID-19 situation and if schools are open. In the interim, Bauman said they will work in small groups with schools who have facilities as a setup process for a potential restart. This is not about tournament. This is not a tournament being launched. So, so. Um, so let's set aside the tournament for now until you receive that um, release from us saying that the festival or five challenge series or whatever other tournament is scheduled at such and such time, then we report tournament. So this is just a restart strategy that YBG is all uh, and the uh, Shuri's uh, family and, and businesses are participating in today. And how this strategy will work is. Um, we have a number of schools. In fact, this year when we do launch a tournament, it's going to be a downsized tournament in the first instant. And initially, we're going to be focusing and working um, with those schools that have facilities or access to facilities. So um, the, the, the tournament becomes more local um, in this new pandemic era. That's how we plan to um, um, maneuver tournaments. Bowman for the reveal of magnitude of the sponsorship from the companies. It's a significant um, sponsorship. Uh, I think uh, our um, it's, it's in um, in the area of one point eight to nine million dollars when we look at the trans when we look at the conversions. Uh, but that is a significant sponsorship. Let me put that into perspective. Now, the year of YBG programming, the programs that we cover, like the festival and match uh, the uh, fives and our end of the or the whole operation um, budget for a year um, falls just around nine to ten million dollars um, but this um, sponsorship today is what is operationalizing us into the um, into the posture to be able to really um, have school basketball activities uh, restart Daniel Lanfoot and Ross Shores of Edison Shores Offshore stated they are delighted to partner with YGB given the agenda of grassroots development. This is what we're looking for. You know, something that helps the youth of Guyana, something that helps them develop, something that keeps them focused, something that does more than just teach them basketball, but teach them how to be men and women. And that's what we attempt to do also back home. So this is why we're excited to be a part of this and this opportunity and we want to see it grow and uh, you know speaking you know Ross goes speaking the family's part but this goes all the way from his, his, his dad he was very excited uh, when the request came to, to participate in this and we're looking forward to seeing uh, how how's it grow and getting kids back on the court. Basketball is something that's near and dear to my heart my parents played my entire family played I, I played my whole life so I was able to see firsthand the uh, um, all the good things that basketball can bring, both on the court and off the court, uh, from the team sport perspective, 
teaching you good life lessons that everyone that plays basketball uh, takes with them many years after they've finished their basketball career. So uh, we're just really blessed and thankful to uh, be able to participate and have this partnership today, and we're really excited for it. According to YBG, Edison Shores Offshore is an American company with local subsidiary G Boats Guyana. That is insurance offshore companies, ECO, are recognized as the most diverse and dynamic marine transportation solution provided in the world. ECO provides supply vessels to oil and gas operators around the world, including ExxonMobil. For the newsroom, Akim Green. I will tell you now that Josh Butler's brutal hitting trumped the genius of Virat Kohli in England's 8 wicket defeat of India in the 30 20 in Ahmedabad. Butler muscled an unbeaten 83 from 52 balls to help England to their target of 157 with 10 balls to spare. That was still closer than the contest could have been when India found themselves at 24 for 3 after 6 overs and 87 for 5 from 15. They were kept in it by Captain Kohli, whose thrilling 77 not out of 46 balls eliminated a stadium left empty by the decision to play the last three matches of the series behind closed doors. On the day Captain Ian Morgan became the first man to reach 100 T20 caps for England, his side moved 2-1 up in the series with two matches to play and they can seal the series on Thursday. And with that, we've come to the end of the news for this evening. Of course, you can find updates on these and other stories on our website, newsroom.gy, our Facebook page, or Instagram. On behalf of the entire news team, my name is Avanash Ramzan. Thanks for watching. Be safe. See you next time.